Uh, we can go ahead and get started today. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to everyone for being here today. Um, my name is Jane Allen, and I'm the manager for the Regenerative Recovery Coalition at the Alliance Center. And we are so excited to be gathered today to discuss uh, one of the most important tools that we have at our disposal to address some of the toughest challenges ahead of us. Um, as Colorado continues to recover from the pandemic, we have seen a historic amount of funds flow through the state to address areas such as affordable housing, mental health, and the economy. And we recognize that while we won't agree on everything, we do want to spend this time today to focus on the areas where we can find common ground and to highlight some of the bipartisan collaboration around Colorado's American Rescue Plan funds. Uh, today, you will hear from legislators on their priorities for the current session, as well as their approach for building the state forward towards a more resilient future. We're really grateful for our speakers today and want to just flag that not everyone we had originally planned for will be able to make it. We were very ambitious to schedule a policy event in the midst of a legislative session uh, and are lucky to have any legislator uh, talk with us during this time. And we appreciate your understanding if this lineup has had some recent changes. This is the world of policymaking and things always come up at the last minute. Um, before we dive into today's session, I want to go ahead and take a moment to acknowledge the land that we stand on and the historic racial injustices that have brought us to this current moment. So I'm actually going to invite our new director of communication and marketing, Ali Shea, to lead us in our land and equity acknowledgements. So Ali, go ahead and take it away. Hi everyone, thanks for the introduction, Jane. I will go ahead and start out with the land acknowledgement. So, as Coloradans, we stand on the unceded ancestral lands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Lakota, and Ute nations and peoples. These lands were also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other indigenous tribes. We recognize native and indigenous peoples as the original stewards of this land and our presence among their descendants who still dwell within it. We pay our respects to indigenous and native elders, past and present, Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of colonial violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that have brought us to our current moment. Next, I shall move on to the equity acknowledgement. We acknowledge that racial justice, equity, and climate justice are inextricably intertwined and that poor, vulnerable, and primarily Black, Indigenous, and people of color disproportionately bear the burden of climate change impacts and environmental justice due to lingering effects of systemic discriminatory practices. We commit to doing our part to ensure that when taking any action to address climate change and create a regenerative future, we will respect, promote, and consider our respective obligations concerning all aspects of equity and strive to create systems in which everyone can thrive. Thank you for sharing that moment with us. We strive to consider equity in every aspect of our work and are committed to this learning journey to show up better and do better every single day. Thank you so much, Allie, for leading us in that session. And thank you to uh, everyone else for sharing that moment with us. We wanna take this moment to uh, thank our generous sponsors who made this work possible. Vermilion, Odell Brewing, and Foot Law Firm, we are so grateful for your contributions and commitments to build a brighter future. Our time today will go by very quickly, so here is a quick preview of what's coming next. We will share a bit about the Regenerative Recovery Coalition, why we are here, what we are currently working on, and what we hope to achieve in the years ahead. We will then have a special pre-recorded video from the Lieutenant Governor, Diane Primavera, sharing more about the state's recovery efforts. Then we will get into our main event, a legislative panel moderated by Alliance Center board member, Natrice Bryant, with Speaker of the House, Alec Garnett, Senator Cleve Simpson, and Senator Chris Hansen. 
Time permitting, we may take a couple questions from the audience at the end of the panel. So be sure to put your questions in the chat box. I just want to also um, put a note out to everyone that we did receive word from Senator Simpson that he will be in committee today. So he may be joining us a bit later, or he might not be able to attend depending on how long the session runs. Um, I told him it was totally fine if he wanted to sign on a little late. Um, but again, we appreciate your understanding as this is a very busy time of year for our legislators. After the panel wraps, we will close with some calls to action and concluding remarks. And we just wanna thank you so much for uh, sharing this time with us. And we look forward to the conversation ahead. Um, as we start here, I really wanna share a bit about our roots and how we were called to this present moment. Since our founding, the Alliance Center has existed to bring people together to solve systemic problems. Our building and nonprofit center has continued to connect a community of organizations and businesses working to find solutions at the nexus of community, the economy, and the environment. In spring of 2020, we responded to the COVID crisis by mobilizing our network and launching the Colorado Emergent Series where we heard from hundreds of Coloradans about what they want the state's recovery to look like as we rebuild. This led us to create a coalition of change agents, change agents across a multitude of sectors, united by a common vision to build a regenerative future. We are focused on advancing the areas you see on the gear icons in front of you. Goals tied to these eight fundamentals include things like transitioning to renewable energy, strengthening our food systems, and building the industries and workforce of the future. If you're new here, you may be wondering, what is a regenerative recovery? Well, we see it as one that will build a robust localized economy that abundantly meets human needs while equitably providing all the resources that we need to survive and thrive. Fast forward to today, and the coalition is now 360 members strong. And through this membership represents over 20,000 jobs in our state and 7.2 billion in revenue. We wanna take this moment now to share a quick video with you all that highlights the overall mission and vision of the coalition. And I'm actually gonna stop my screen share so that Ali can share the video uh, with hopefully less lag time when we stream it over Zoom. So thank you, Allie. Yes, let me go ahead and get this started. One moment, please. Okay. And I will go ahead and hit play. When the pandemic hit, the Alliance Center used this time of change to create a finer future because going back to normal is not an option. Normal didn't work. It was broken. Instead, let's create a society in which everyone can thrive. Let's build forward towards a regenerative future. But what is a regenerative future? One that is based on transformative values instead of transactional ones. The ability to adapt to change and thrive. Paying a fair wage and creating jobs and uh, building out this economy. You have better technology that's going to require less energy to provide the same comfort and services that we enjoy today. We're at a moment when it's kind of all hands on deck around the globe. We can leave this place better than we found it, and we're gonna do that. But let's be real, creating this is a massive task. It cannot be done by any single organization or individual. So that's why we form the Regenerative Recovery Coalition. The coalition represents hundreds of change agents working together to create shared prosperity on a healthy planet. We are at a tipping point. How will you use your power during this time of change? Join us to help tip the scales towards a regenerative future. Thanks for sharing that, Ali. I'll go ahead and share my screen again. All righty, let me get this slideshow pulled up. All right. 
So we've seen the video and understand the mission and vision, but what does this look like in action? Well, in 2020, we crowdsourced policy ideas from our coalition members, which helped to influence 20 new state laws and allocate $456 million in recovery funds in 2021. In preparation for this year's session, we again worked with our members to share their incremental and transformational policy ideas with Colorado legislators and ended up with a policy platform containing 58 policy ideas. Our members worked to edit, categorize, and prioritize these ideas every step of the way. Currently, there are 13 bills moving through the legislature right now that the coalition has recommended or voiced their support for since 2020. We are working to endorse those publicly as a coalition and also within our organization. Additionally, today is a very special day uh, as Governor Polis introduced a slate of air quality packages to increase investments in areas like transit, building efficiency, and energy codes. We know that there are many others who have been working diligently to craft these proposals, and we are grateful for their efforts and to have a voice and play a role in helping to support that work. It's also worth noting that a majority of the ARPA proposals have not been introduced yet, and we anticipate several more coming from our recommendations related to workforce and affordable housing as well. This year, we shared those policy ideas from the coalition members in testimony for the Economic Recovery and Relief Committee. We've had several meetings with the administration and legislators, many of whom played a key role in the recent air quality and climate legislation and hosted advocacy training sessions in partnership with E2 and Good Business Colorado to help our members advocate for the issues that they care about. In addition to policy, our coalition has mobilized around four key areas for this year. And those are agriculture, energy, business, and workforce development. I'm gonna share a bit about what our working groups are currently working on right now. So the food systems and ag group is focusing on growing the regenerative ag movement in Colorado. And doing this by hosting a series of farm tours across the state which will help to build a bridge between rural and urban regions, connect food producers with one another and also the community at large, all while educating the public on the importance of regenerative agriculture. We are also working with one of our members, Zero Food Print and the Colorado Department of Ag on a statewide healthy soils challenge to raise 5 million per year by 2025 to support landowners as they work to implement healthy soil practices that take carbon out of the atmosphere increase soil health and improve water retention. We are grateful for these partnerships and the potential this project has to tip the scales towards a healthier future. The Energy and Climate Group is focusing on ensuring a just transition for the oil and gas workforce through policy, elevating the stories of frontline communities and oil and gas workers, as well as data and research uh, analysis. I wanna acknowledge that there are likely differing opinions on this topic in the room today, and that's okay, but we also know that Colorado has a goal to become 100% renewable by 2040. And this is at a time when we're seeing major shifts in the, in, in the industry and also incredible extreme events caused by climate change. And we want to make sure that Colorado is preparing for this necessary and urgent transition. If you feel uncertain about this path, I want to call you in to work with us on this. We wanna hear from you and your perspectives. Our goal here is really to ensure that as this industry continues to transition, that no one person or community is left behind and that Colorado continues to be a climate leader. The business working group is helping to define what it means for a business to be truly regenerative in today's day and age. They're emphasizing a focus on restoring the health of individuals, communities, and a planet, and the planet at every step of a business's operations. The goal is to create an assessment that businesses can take to figure out where they are along their journey and how they can become a force for good in the world. The picture on the right is actually an example of some of the communication collateral the group is currently working on. And the next step will be to work with local businesses to refine these tools and to create a framework for the assessment. 
And finally, the workforce group is focused on a three-part strategy to support equitable workforce development in Colorado. The first is accelerating and incentivizing policies that will grow the demand for jobs in industries such as clean energy, agriculture, and the circular economy. Many of the policies that we have shared and supported are in service to this. The second is a communications campaign to get more people involved in the skilled trades and to see it as a sustainable and viable career path. At a time when there is a huge labor shortage in the skilled trades and we are facing an ever-growing student debt burden, we feel that this is more important than ever. And the third piece of this is connecting what we call the backbone infrastructure of community colleges, credentialing partners, uh, industry, employers, workforce centers, um, to create programs that will prepare the state's workforce as we make the transition to clean energy. So far, we have collectively raised 480,000 for this with most of those funds going directly back out to our partners who are involved in this work. Earlier this year, we also submitted a competitive application to the Economic Development Administration in collaboration with 12 other partners, including NREL, the Colorado Workforce Development Council, Solar Energy International, and several community colleges across the state. This application has the potential to bring 12 million to grow the state's workforce in clean energy. And that's not all. <laughs> For 2022, we are actually working with our partners at the Equity Project to host eight workshops for our coalition members, as well as our board and staff to help ensure that we have the tools and understanding to make equity a pillar in all that we do and to create a culture of upstanders who embody equity principles in their work, family, and communities. That's a bit about what we've been up to. And of course, none of this is possible without you, our coalition members. We are grateful to each and every one of you for working to ensure that Colorado emerges from the pandemic towards a climate resilient and more equitable future. Well, I feel like I've talked enough and I will uh, actually hand it over to Brenna now to share a bit about scaling this model and take us into our next session. So Brenna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jane. It's wonderful to hear all of the different updates and all the amazing things the coalition is up to. So I appreciate you walking us through that. And as you said, of course, none of that work would be possible without our coalition members. So thank each and every one of you tuning in today. We couldn't be in community and doing this work together if it wasn't for you and for everyone rowing together in the same direction towards an ambitious vision. So thank you so much for everything you all do every day. The updates that Jane had just shared with you have actually started to receive some national and international attention with folks, individuals, governments, localities, institutions, organizations, really interesting, interested in what we're doing here in Colorado. What are the key ingredients for success? What's the strategy for scale and replication? And how do we actually grow this model outside of Colorado? So I will share uh, something to celebrate. Hewlett Foundation actually provided us some grant funding earlier this year to basically do just that, to document what we're calling the replication playbook to outline and document everything we've done over the last two years in response to the pandemic through this coalition model, identify the key ingredients for success, replication and scale, and then actually launch a national coalition by the end of this year. So we're gonna be working on that through this summer and fall. If anyone's really interested in that, interested in more national level work, please do reach out to Jane or myself and we'll make sure to get you plugged in there. And I wanna be clear that when we talk about a national coalition by end of 2022, I do not mean that we're going to have field officers and, you know, different coalitions in all 50 states, you know, immediately or, or right away. But what we will do is actually expand the membership of the coalition beyond just Colorado. So groups can join who aren't just here in our state and we'll start to kind of cross pollinate best practices and information exchange while we look at the different landscapes that are ripe for replication and scale and where would be the next place that we do actually start to go organize in other locations. And of course, through all of that, we're going to stay grounded and centered in Colorado. Colorado is our home. It's our hub. It's our pilot. And I would say it's the most fertile testing grounds anywhere in the nation for how do we grow and scale the regenerative movement. So really exciting things to come. Stay tuned on that, and we'll make sure to kind of update you all as that progresses. 
um, you know, we are excited about this future, about how do we help grow and replicate the success from, um, from the coalition model outside of, of just Colorado into the entire country and even into maybe international territory. So a lot to come on that. And we do think that Colorado really is primed to serve as this powerful model for regenerative progress due to the hard work of people like you to the hard work and leadership of the legislators and leaders that we're about to hear from later this afternoon. And of course, through the power of strategic collaboration towards a shared and ambitious vision. I hope many of you were able to tune into the press conference this morning. If you didn't see it, please go check it out. We'll drop it in the chat here. We'll be posting it on the Alliance Facebook as well. Uh, but Governor Polis, as well as a slate of um, key legislative leaders, some of which you'll hear from today, unveiled a clean air agenda this morning that had basically five point priorities in there. And it was really amazing to see direct alignment in the policy platform that the coalition had released at the end of last year. So all five of the top level uh, clean air priorities as well as some of the you know the details when you start unpacking them are in direct alignment to the policy work that this coalition produced so you know very um that's definitely something to celebrate and of course as jane said it takes everybody working together to make that happen we also have been continuing to deepen our relationship with the executive and legislative branches of the government. And our goal really is to connect them to the voices of the people to connect them to you so that together we can advance a regenerative society. And on that note, both Governor Polis and Lieutenant Governor Primavera wanted to be here today and um, were hoping to join us to share some remarks, but they were not able to with everything moving in their schedules. So the Lieutenant Governor did record a video, uh, especially for you guys, and she wanted uh, us to share that today. So with that, we'll go ahead and pull up a quick video here from uh, Lieutenant Governor Primavera. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I'm sorry that I'm not able to join you in person today. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you on behalf of the Polis Primavera administration. I know that everyone gathered today is here because they are committed to bettering the lives of all Coloradoans. And we know that the best way for us to do that is to work together across industries, sectors, and sides of the aisle. Everyone has a role to play in making Colorado the best state in the country to call home. Over the last two years, communities around the state have come together to support one another in their times of greatest need. Too many have had to endure a tragedy heaped on hardship, but we have emerged from those challenges stronger and more committed than ever, more committed than ever before to making sure that Colorado is a place where everyone has the opportunity to thrive. From day one of our administration, Governor Polis and I have been committed to bringing together diverse coalitions of Coloradoans to find bold, innovative, and collaborative solutions to our biggest challenges. Thanks to that engagement and commitment from people all over the state, we've made significant progress in lowering the astronomical costs of healthcare and prescription drugs, taking action to combat the already present effects of climate change, and set Colorado on a path to renewable energy by 2040, eliminating fees and reforming Colorado's tax code to work for everyone, not just the wealthiest 1%, and ensuring that the next generation of Coloradoans is prepared to lead by implementing full day kindergarten and now universal preschool, in addition to creating the Department of Early Childhood. And we've done nearly all of this with resounding bipartisan support. Many people are surprised to learn that 96% of the bills passed during last year's legislative session had support from both Republicans and Democrats. We get things done because we are able to put aside partisan politics and find common sense solutions that work for everyone. I'm confident that we will see the same from this year's legislative session, which will be a uniquely impactful one. Thanks to truly unprecedented and historic funding coming into the state through the American Rescue Plan Act, we have had an opportunity to make transformational, tangible change for Coloradoans as we continue to build back stronger from the pandemic. Long before the pandemic, there were systemic inequities and disparities that kept too many Coloradoans from thriving. Our job now is to address those gaps. And thanks to the work of our partners in the private sector, local and tribal governments and community leaders, 
as well as the Behavioral Health Transformational Task Force and the Affordable Housing Transformational Task Force, we have well-crafted policy recommendations to act on. We find ourselves living through a pivotal moment in history, a pandemic, climate disasters, and current geopolitical events have acted like a black light, revealing challenges that must be confronted and underscoring the importance of working together and from a place of care for our neighbors. I encourage all of you to stay engaged and find ways to continue to serve by running for local office, getting involved on a board or a commission, or volunteering your time through an AmeriCorps program. It's going to take all of us working together to make our vision of a Colorado for all a reality. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We're, it's always like holding your breath when you share videos on Zoom. So I'm glad that uh, showed up well for me. I hope you were able to enjoy that as well. And we thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor Primavera. It's always nice to get the peek behind the curtain to better understand the priorities and work of the administration. And as you heard, there are so many ways that we are regenerating as a state. And there's still a lot of work ahead of us. One of the change agents in the administration that gives me continual hope due to her tireless leadership, strategic vision, and innate ability to connect to people when and where it matters is Natrice Bryant. She is also our board member of the Alliance Center and she's a moderator for this afternoon. Natrice is the deputy chief Chief Customer Officer for the Governor's Office of Information Technology. She also serves on the state and local stim as the state and local stimulus coordinator for Colorado under the Office of Economic Development and International Trade for the American Rescue Plan Act funding. You might hear some of us use the acronym ARPA. That's for the American Rescue Plan Act funding. What that basically means is that Natrice is working closely with the administration, with legislators, and with communities all across the state to direct Colorado stimulus funding in a way that uplifts the quality of life for all Coloradans. Natrice has not only had a front row seat, but a leading role in shaping the state strategy, and she'll be guiding us through the panel conversation this afternoon. Natrice, it is an honor to share the screen with you. As Jane said, we've had some changes with our panelists this afternoon. So we appreciate your grace and understanding. It's either the, the genius or the chaos of working with legislators during session. And we really do appreciate all of your flexibility, Natrice, especially you. So we have had some speaker changes. Originally, we were gonna be joined by Senator Simpson, who's a Republican representing District 35. There still is a chance he might join us later if his committee gets out, but uh, we're not holding our breaths for that, although we really do hope he's able to join us. Uh, Minority Leader Hugh McKean, who's also a Republican, represents District 51, had to back out last minute this morning due to some changes on a, on a work site that he's engaged with. He does send his regards and apologies for not being able to join, and I know he wish he could have been here with us this afternoon. We do have joining us Speaker of the House Alec, Alec Garnett, and he is a Democrat representing District 2, as well as Senator Chris Hansen, who is at the press conference this morning, and he represents District 31 and is also a Democrat. So with that, I'll welcome the panelists to the screen and uh, pass it over to you, Natrice. Just give me one minute and I will spotlight the speakers. Thank you, Brenna. While you're spotlighting us, I'm going to go ahead and give a little bit of an introduction on what we'll be talking about today. Um, as you all know, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to really utilize funds in ARPA to leverage some of the things that we see across the board that have been challenging for the state. Uh, in my roles, I've had the pleasure of working with both Speaker Garnett and Senator Hansen in regard to affordable housing, behavioral health and mental health workforce capacity, and then workforce as a whole. And these topics you'll hear us talk a little bit about today, but you'll also see them reflected in some of the bills that will be coming out or have come out through the legislature. We have dedicated legislators that are putting forth the effort to ensure that we are able to utilize these funds that are once in a lifetime funds. And when I say that, I mean, hopefully this never happens again so we don't have to have all this money coming through the state but at the same time this just shows our bipartisan effort to ensure that we actually are utilizing our dollars effectively as we begin this conversation today you'll hear from both speaker garnett and senator hansen in regard to 
their, their take on what a transformational Colorado looks like, but also having conversations about reflecting on how we move forward and what we move forward with on our leveraging uh, fund abilities. So with that, I will go ahead and start asking a couple of questions in regard to um, our topics. We will have six questions, so I'll just set the stage there, six questions that both panelists will answer, and we will leave time for questions at the end. You are also able to chat questions in the chat, and we have uh, individuals that will be looking at that for me, and we will open it up for questions at the end of the panel. So my first question to both of you, can you share more about your background and experience and why you were called into public service? You want me yeah, to go? happy. Yeah, you yeah go, go ahead, Alex. All right, uh, great. Uh, Natrice, first, um, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for uh, moderating today. It's such a pleasure uh, working with you. I couldn't, um, I, I agree with everything Brenna said. Uh, we're so lucky to have you uh, at the helm and, and helping us solve all these big problems. So thanks so much for your service. Brenna, thanks so much for the invite and for having uh, Senator Hansen and I on. I've been looking forward to this for a very long time and I'm glad today is finally here. I actually never thought we would get to this day because I was like, oh, that's at the end of March and then like it's gonna be April and we're never gonna survive legislative session up to that point, but here we find ourselves. And so that's a, a good benchmark to get to as well. Um, my name is Alec Garnett. I'm the Speaker of the State House. I'm a fourth generation Coloradan. I grew up in Boulder. My parents grew up in Boulder. My um, great grandfather went to the Colorado School of Mines and was a miner. The other side of my family were farmers in um, Brush, Colorado. So I have deep Colorado roots and I uh, love the state more than anywhere in the entire world. And so it's really my honor to serve in the Colorado legislature. My um, fascination with public service in, in trying to create change through the public sector started at an early age. Um, you know, my dad was on the school board, which I always say is sort of the front line of public service. There's nowhere, um, there's no barrier between you and parents um, and, uh, and that is um, noble service. And so I've learned about public education and I learned about how to serve my community um, around the uh, dinner table growing up. When I went to undergrad, I studied history and, and, and uh, uh, poli sci. I got a master's in public administration. I spent time in Washington, DC, where it was sort of the, um, uh, the place where public, you saw public policy being debated and being moved and big problems trying to be solved. And I knew that I wanted to uh, continue to serve and continue to create a change for my community. I never actually thought it was gonna be myself in the principled seat, but the way Colorado works, and it's a beautiful system where as long as you are willing to put the sweat equity in to run for office, there's really no barriers, where in other states, there's more barriers to running. And um, the house that my wife and I lived in in Denver was redrawn into uh, a particular seat in 2014. And it's the youngest house district. House district two is the youngest house district based on average age of voter in the state. I like to say it's the hippest uh, district in the state. And so Emily, my wife, was like, listen, all the problems that people are facing in our district are the problems that we're facing. You should uh, just try to knock a bunch of doors, see if this will work. And sure enough, it did. And again, I've been in the legislature for eight years. So I'm coming up on the end, but it has been the honor of my life to try to come into the public arena and fight and create change. And um, that's a little bit about me and, and how I got started. Thank you, Speaker. Senator Hansen, do you mind sharing the same information? Yeah, happy to, uh, and just really appreciate being with everybody today. I, I am the the sub for uh, our Senate President Steve Fenberg. So I'm sorry you're you're stuck with me today, and, and instead of Steve, uh, but he he sends his regrets, and I'm, I was happy to to uh, fill in for him and be part of this great conversation. Um, you know, just a, a, a bit of background and how I ended up in public service, not dissimilar to what you just heard from the speaker. Um, you know, I grew up in a little farm town in western Kansas, right on the Colorado border, not far from Burlington, and uh, went to undergrad uh, at K-State and did engineering, and there got very involved in student politics and uh, very involved in understanding, uh, you know, energy policy more uh, as, as it related to the engineering work that I was doing, and then, uh, like Alec, went out to D.C., uh, got the beltway out of my system, two years was enough. Uh, but worked in the Clinton administration for a little bit uh, in the Department of Commerce, and then went back to grad school and did a master's in engineering and then a PhD uh, in energy economics. And, you know, really 
uh, had a long-term interest in, in energy policy, in particular environmental policy. And I, I had one of those, what I refer to as burn the ships moment. I was working in the private sector at a big company here in, in town called IHS, left my job uh, and started knocking doors, just like Alec. And uh, 5,000 doors later and, and one election later, I, I find myself in the house serving, serving with the speaker. Uh, and, and then uh, uh, three years ago, switched over to the Senate. So this is my sixth year uh, at the Capitol, just a couple of years behind Alec. And um, you know, really left my job because I wanted to work on climate change. That was the issue that, that really motivated me to make, make that big change in my life. And uh, I'm excited to be part of this conversation because I know we're gonna get a chance to talk a lot about some of those policies, some of the things that we've accomplished uh, looking backwards, but also uh, some great things we've got on the docket this year uh, to continue that work. And so thanks for having me today. Thank you both. Um, given that information that you've all just shared, what are your top priorities for the 2022 legislative session and why? Uh, Speaker Garnett, we'll start with you. Thanks, Centrice. Well, first, let me just um, say we are very, very blessed to have Senator Hansen in the legislature. We've been working together for six years and there's no one smarter. There's no better expert on energy policy than Senator Hansen. And so to have that wealth of experience and knowledge in the building on the policy making side um, is something that all Coloradans should feel really proud of. And I um, it's an honor to serve with him. Uh, this session is um, it's unique uh, compared to uh, some of the past sessions that uh, I have served in, partly because due to the pandemic, the interest and focus of uh, Coloradans across the state has really kind of narrowed in on three key areas. It's the most consolidated I have seen the Colorado um, electorate in terms of what they want to see the Colorado legislature focusing on. They want to see us focusing in on how to save people money. They want us focusing on how to make sure that their kids are set up to be successful in uh, a school. And they want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep their community safe. And I, um, I think a lot of this is due to COVID. I think, you know, the classroom is uh, I think is the front line of this pandemic. The impact on teachers and on students and on teachers or and on, and on parents um, has created a lot of stress in our public school system. You're going to see us. Uh, we just passed the budget yesterday or the today actually through the House. It's going over to the Senate. Uh, Senator Hansen's on the Joint Budget Committee. Uh, we are investing historic amounts in our K through 12 system because we want to make sure that we're getting dollars into the classroom, that the uh, 178 school districts have the resources that they need uh, to be successful uh, going into next year, and that we're making sure people are set up for success. There's also a bill that being debated, and the reason that President uh, uh, Fenberg can't be with us today is because he's in committee on uh, on a bill to create universal preschool through a new cabinet level department for early childhood education. I ran it in the house uh, last week. I have three young kiddos, six and three and nine months. And I know uh, how important early childhood education is. I also know how hard it is to find and how expensive it is. And so I really think you're gonna see us this year focusing in on the, on the bookends and on the middle of the education spectrum to make sure that parents have the resources and have the system set up for their kids to be successful. Um, I will also just say when it comes to saving people money, this is a challenging time for Coloradans. Uh, we are a very popular state. There are a lot of people moving here. We have seen our population increase um, almost double digits since I've been in the legislature. There are also um, inflationary pressures that we don't have any control over that are making uh, it tough for families to make ends meet. So you're going to see the legislature doing the best that we can with the tools that we have to help save people money. And when it comes to making communities safer, uh, there's a bunch of bills making their way through the process to make sure that community organizations um, and different uh, law enforcement uh, agencies and others have what they need to recruit good, high qualified people um, in to do the work to make sure that people uh, feel safe here in Colorado. So I, I think that uh, we're delivering on the three big issues that we identified at the beginning of session. And I look forward to us getting everything across the finish line before May 11th, because that is the last day of session. Thank you, Speaker. Senator Hansen. Yeah, well, I, it, I'll do my best to, to uh, not overlap with the great areas that the speaker just covered and, and uh, cover some of the other important things we're doing. And 
folks might uh, be interested to know, we, we typically evaluate about 800 bills per year. Um, we normally pass about 450 of them and uh, 90 plus percent are bipartisan. Uh, and so to give you a sense of kind of the size and scope of, of what we try to do in 120 days, um, and the speaker did a great job of covering some of those, those highlighted areas. All, uh, you know, when I think about my top priorities for this session, I, I serve as vice chair of the Joint Budget Committee and chair uh, the Senate Appropriations Committee. So that means I spend a lot of time on budget and uh, taxation policy. But then the, the other half that, that I talked about in my intro is energy and environment. So I, I, I'd say I roughly split my time between those two areas. And on, on the budget side, uh, as, as Alec mentioned, we just got the budget through the House. It's coming over to the Senate next week to finalize that. Um, I think we've made some historic investments in higher ed, in K-12, uh, early childhood, some new uh, housing and mental health programs, um, done some, I think, some great new investments for seniors. So a lot of great things in this budget. And you're going to continue to see some of those big investments uh, the, play out for the rest of the session. Like the the uh, that you know Brenna mentioned the the press conference that we had this morning on the clean air package. That's another place where we're making historic investments and working closely with the governor to allocate uh, you know hundreds of millions of dollars to clean up Colorado's air and reduce pollution. So so many uh, I think big packages in motion because of the combination of the ARPA, the federal dollars, as well as some some general funds that we were able to set aside last year as the economy recovered. A bit faster than we expected. Um, in that second category, just to quickly mention, um, you know, a couple of bills that I've been working heavily on: Senate Bill 138, which is a, a, a greenhouse gas reduction bill, covers a number of different areas that I think fit this conversation pretty well, including agriculture offsets, agriculture decarbonization, uh, agrivoltaics that some of you may be interested in, uh, making sure that we understand climate risk in the uh, para portfolio. Uh, and the you know the giant pension fund that is part of that one in six Coloradans is a, a member of, so lots of different things in in Senate Bill 138, and then also working to electrify heating and cooling in the state uh, in Senate Bill 51, uh, because we know from the air quality discussion that the faster we can electrify everything, uh, the faster we can get to reducing emissions, both both uh, ozone emissions as well as uh, greenhouse gas. So those are I guess kind of my two main main categories of priorities uh, and, and looking forward to diving into the details as folks would like on this on this conversation. Thank you both. Um, we've got some questions coming in, but I am going to hold on those until the end so I can make sure we get through all of what we're talking about. But please continue to put those in the chat so we can continue to answer those as we get through. Um, as we go to the next question, it, it kind of shifts us, gentlemen. We're looking at the unprecedented flow of capital that's come to the country um, with our COVID and recovery dollars. So we had CARES funding, we have ARPA dollars, we've got a lot of money coming our way. How has this impacted your approach with the priorities that you just talked about? And Senator Hansen, let's switch it up and start with you and then we'll go to Speaker Garnett. Yeah, uh, happy to, to dive in on that one. You know, you're, you're exactly right. The huge uh, you know, I sort of mentioned it in my in my previous answer that the you know we had about four billion dollars coming from the ARPA uh, package to the state of Colorado, just shy of four billion, and then we also had about two billion dollars of general fund that we were able to set aside to do some additional uh, one-time investments, and that is unprecedented. That has never happened in the history of the state of Colorado. We in a normal year, what I've said to people is we would typically allocate three to four hundred million in discretionary spending, new, new dollars. And most of that would go directly to K-12 to cover inflation. Um, this time around, we had appropriation decisions of about four to $5 billion. So it was kind of uh, 10X uh, our normal workload when it comes to, to those appropriations. And we had, uh, as, as Brenna mentioned in the intro, you know, summer and fall task force uh, set up on mental health, uh, behavioral health, housing, uh, economic recovery, workforce issues, and we've got hundreds of millions set aside for each of those sub areas that we're now going to start to uh, see those bills come through the, the, the building. And so lots of big decisions ahead, hundreds of millions of dollars at a time that we'll be allocating to those important investments. And that is a, a, that is a once in a lifetime sort of opportunity. And we're trying to really, uh, as my dad would say, you know, measure twice, cut once, uh, be, be careful, be really judicious. Uh, and I think we've we've demonstrated that, and and uh, you know the speaker's been a, been a, 
a big leader on a, on a bunch of those areas as we as we carefully craft those bills. Thank you, Senator. Speaker Garnett. Thanks, Senator Treese. Yeah, uh, Senator Hansen did a great job of kind of capturing the moment that we have found ourselves in. Remember, uh, in 20, um, uh, 2020, it's hard in COVID time to remember uh, the years, but in 2020, uh, our economists were predicting that the economy was going to um, really contract in a pretty dramatic way. And so when, um, you know, in those first couple of months, we were faced with an unprecedented process of trying to cut billions of dollars from our budget to prepare ourselves for what was going to be a very challenging time ahead. What's amazing about Colorado, and I know all of you guys know this, is how resilient we are and how, um, I, you know, I was surprised, but then when you think about it, not too surprised at how quickly our economy bounced back um, from what our economists predicted was going to happen. So that's where the additional general fund revenue that the that Senator Hansen mentioned came from was, you know, we predicted that there were going to be, uh, we had to make all of these cuts, but our, our economy did quite well. And so we were able to quickly turn around and reinvest those dollars in a one-time way to help those areas that were most uh, hard hit, uh, hospitality, uh, small businesses, and restaurants in particular. And um, now what we're looking at is with the $4 billion that we received from um, the, the feds around ARPA, when you look at what other states have done with these dollars, I would say Colorado's approach is one of the most creative thoughtful approaches that we've seen across the country. Really, what we did uh, from the legislative perspective, both the House and the Senate, is we came together and we, and we tried to think through transformational change. If we're only going to get this opportunity one time, like Senator Hansen said, how are, what do we need to do to make sure that we are setting Colorado on a better track uh, for the future? What are the big areas that we see as being fundamental problems that we need to create transformational change around? And so those, those issues identified by Senator Hansen are mental and behavioral health system. We are one of the, uh, we don't invest enough in mental and behavioral health. All of us know that, especially as sort of awareness around mental and behavioral health changes across the country. Two, affordable housing. Every one of us is feeling the pinch around affordable housing. Uh, workforce, you know, from the changing economy to uh, workforce um, uh, changes just here in our own state, uh, we are going to better prepare people for the future. And then sort of future economic uh, relief. And these were all buckets that we prioritized last year. And then we spent all summer, we went on, we kind of did a road show and we asked people what they cared about. Then we took all of the, all that feedback. We identified these buckets that we we were going to prioritize. Then we set up these interim task forces to work all summer to get that, uh, to get those ideas to come forward, to put them into legislation that is now making its way through the system. I don't think any other state has gone through a process quite like this. It is, I think, um, something that we're all going to be able to look back on, point to huge projects around homelessness, around affordable housing that we can point to and say, we would have never had the opportunity uh, to make those investments uh, without this once in a lifetime opportunity, I think we're going to be proud of what gets done. Um, but we got to make sure, like Senator Hansen said, that there's big decisions ahead, that we get everything across the finish line, and that we uh, kind of fulfill the promise that we've made to the people of Colorado. Thank you both. I can say personally, having worked for the state for eight years and government for 15, this is one of the biggest changes that I've seen us ever have to go through. We've had fires, we've had floods, we've had tornadoes, but we haven't had a pandemic. And I just commend all of you for being able to work through some of how do we get this money back into our community. So thank you for what you're doing in regard to that effort. As we look at the massive amounts of change that we've all experienced over the past two years, how can we work together in a nonpartisan effort to nurture our economy, community, and environment? Speaker, I'll start with you. Thanks, Natrice. And let me just say, for everyone on the call, we wouldn't be moving forward on this transformational change if it wasn't for Natrice. Natrice, thanks for all of your work uh, helping us get there. Um, you know, listen, I'm a... Uh, you know, I come from a very blue district. Um, I have a pretty... Um, uh, I have a pretty interesting philosophy when it comes to uh, bipartisanship. And, and my, my theory is when you come into this building, you know, Colorado has one of the best systems around when it comes to working together. Almost 90% of the bills that we pass are bipartisan. Every member gets to introduce five bills regardless of 
which party you're from, whether or not you're in the majority or the minority. Um, you know, both uh, Senator Hansen and I serve in the majority, uh, but I really, uh, my belief is a good idea is a good idea. It's not a Republican idea. It's not a Democratic idea. A good idea uh, can live on in this building regardless of who uh, whose idea it is. And I think that's really important to the future of Colorado. And this institution is really built on bipartisanship. As we find ourselves in maybe one of the most partisan times that I can remember, um, it's important to remember that it's okay to disagree with each other. You know, even in the short time that I've served in office, in the eight years that I've served in office, the biggest change has been in our inability to disagree with each other in respectful ways. People used to come up on my porch and they would sit on my porch and they'd be like, you know, Alec, I can't believe you voted this way. You've lost my support. I'm gonna support the person who runs against you. I'm so mad at you. And I would say, that's okay. That's your right. This is why I did what I did. You have every right to feel that way, but it would be a meaningful conversation back and forth. We have gotten to a place now where people disagree with me and they like threaten to kill me or threaten to like kill my family. And that's not how, that's not how this country was founded. Our country was founded on the foundation of learning how to disagree with each other. And this building, uh, the Capitol and the legislative process is built on how can people disagree with each other? How can we take one idea and make it better or make it uh, solve that problem uh, in a way that maybe the person never thought of. And so I'm a firm believer in uh, this institution, in our uh, uh, form of government, in our ability to come together and solve big problems. I know we can do it. If, if, uh, uh, if the two Republicans who were supposed to be on today would have been on, you would have heard the same thing. Uh, Minority Leader McKean and I, we talk every single day. We text every single day. We're always working together. We're always trying to figure out how to solve big problems together or minimize the amount of disruption between the two sides. Um, I hope that we can continue to do that. My, the most important job that I have as speaker right now is making sure that the decorum of the chamber, that the institution itself lives on uh, because a hundred, you know, thousands of legislators came in and, and used this system exactly the way that Senator Hanson and I use it. I want to preserve that for the next generation of lawmakers. That's, that's my commitment to this state. That's my promise to this state. And, and these times are tough, but they're going to get better. And, and, and this country has, has worked through these things before. But just I want people to know that bipartisanship lives on uh, deep inside this building. And it's something that we all uh, hold deep uh, in our veins. We cherish these relationships. It's really important to know that we don't always fight with each other. We do come together uh, very, very often. And, um, uh, and we're going to get through this. Um, so that was kind of a long rambling answer, but it's an important question. Thank you, Speaker Garnett. We appreciate it. Senator yep. Hansen, same question. Yeah, I'll just quickly add on because I think the, uh, the funnest part of this is going to be the audience Q&A. So I'll just quickly add that um, you know, I've experienced the Capitol in a very similar way to what the speaker described. Uh, you know, the, the majority of my bills are co-primed with a Republican. The, uh, most of my work is, is bipartisan. The Joint Budget Committee is a very bipartisan place. Um, for any bill to come out of the Joint Budget Committee, it requires a 6-0 vote. So meaning, you know, both sides agree uh, to move something forward. Um, you know, I think we've made progress on big energy policy things in a bipartisan way. Last year, I did a bill uh, on, on improving the electric power grid, uh, Senate Bill 72. That was done with Don Corum, Republican from Montrose. Uh, the year, a couple of years before that, I worked with uh, Representative Becker from Brush, uh, Colorado, Morgan, Morgan County on a storage bill. I mean, it, we've got tons of examples of this happening. And I think the problem is that stuff doesn't make the newspapers. What you see, uh, well, who reads a newspaper? I mean, social media and uh, however else we're getting our news these days. Um, you know, we, we are activated by sort of this micro-targeted media environment that plays to our, sometimes our worst instincts. And we don't get an even keel set of news stories coming in. And they all are, are typically trying to, to build up conflict. And I think, uh, you know, that's what we get coming into our inboxes, into our social media feeds. And the reality is just totally different uh, and at, at the Colorado Capitol. And unfortunately, that just doesn't make it onto social media. Nobody clicks on, uh, you know, uh, Democrats and Republicans agreed today. It's not a very clickable headline. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> I giggle about that, right? It's not a social media topic that um, typically gets the push. 
As we're looking at today's event, um, it's been hosted by the Regenerative Recovery Coalition, which represents over 360 coalition members who are working to build Colorado forward. How can this coalition best partner with you to actualize a regenerative Colorado now and into the future? Senator Hansen, we'll start with you. Yeah, well, I, I would just want to say thank you. I mean, the, the work that Brenna mentioned that the Alliance Center and the, and the coalition was doing during the interim with, with us to figure out how to spend uh, and allocate carefully the ARPA dollars, the state general fund dollars is a perfect example of it. I mean, and the point is engage, come to the table with ideas and hey, let's, let's take a hard look at X, Y, and Z and really be part of that conversation. I mean, that, that's, what, that's when Colorado really takes off and, and does well is when you've got lots of people engaged, lots of great ideas coming to the table. Everybody's got a chance to weigh in and have a voice um, and, I, and I think this coalition is a great example of that. And you've done it uh, in spades over the last year. And I just want to encourage you to, to keep going uh, and, and be a, a productive voice um, that is a great contrast to you know, what we were kind of describing before is sometimes we get some really unproductive conversation uh, that can get us off track. And I think, I think this coalition has demonstrated that you're, you're definitely not in that, in that category. Thank you, Senator Hansen. Speaker Garnett. Thanks, Natrice. Yeah, I mean, I've, I'm so impressed with what uh, you guys have built here. I mean, it's um, really uh, impressive how quickly uh, you guys have been able to pull together so many organizations. I want to tip my hat again to Brenna and her team, to the Alliance Center, to this entire coalition. What I will say, and I will say it again, and I think the next question is, we want to hear from you. Uh, please get to know who your state representative is. Please get to know who your state senator is. You know, we are not DC. Our districts are, you know, they're big, but they're not enormous. And we are always thirsty for those relationships with people in our community who care about what we're doing. Almost, you know, a lot of Coloradans, and this is based on our kind of pioneering uh, founding, kind of think of local control. So they think of their local government or their county government, and then they think of DC. And we have a little bit more of a nimble state government. That was how our founders kind of built, uh, built it this way out West. And sometimes people forget about the state capital and they forget about how much work that we do on behalf of their communities to try to create positive change. But if you reach out and you have coffee with your state rep and you start to build that relationship, like any relationship, it takes time, it takes communication, it takes trust. Then all of a sudden you can find yourself like at the, you know, inner workings of, you know, that kitchen table for that state rep and your opinions can carry huge weight, uh, but you got to, I think, reach out, build those relationships. You can, you can have a huge difference uh, down here. Um, the coalition is a, obviously a huge step, but uh, the coalition members can do that individually as well and kind of spread um, your power and influence that way. Thank you both. And from my personal experience, I can speak to that both Senator Hansen and Speaker Garnett have been extremely available to us when we need to have questions, when we have something we want to talk about. I do encourage you, it can be a little intimidating, but please reach out and do ask questions. Um, that's what their stakeholder engagement process is designed for. As we close out the question portion, the last question I have for you, we know that you're used to getting demands all the time with stakeholders as you just spoke of. Now it's your turn. What is your one call to action to share with coalition members listening today? Speaker Garnett, we'll start with you. Thanks, Natrice. My one call of action is tonight, figure out who your state rep is, figure out who your state senator is, sign up for their newsletter, figure out when there's a community event, go to it, or just reach out and, and set up coffee, get to know them, regardless of what side of the aisle they're on. And um, uh, and make that, just take the time to do that. And all of a sudden you'll find yourself uh, closer to the action than ever before. Um, it's really important. Uh, and with that, I think th that's a great call of action um, today. So I would just urge you to do that. Senator Hansen? Yeah, well, I, I, I think that is great advice. Uh, yeah, please sign up uh, and get to know your legislator. Uh, it's, a, it's a great piece of advice. My call to action is slightly different, which is please never buy another gasoline car again. Uh, if we could all switch over to EVs uh, and electric mowers and electric trimmers and electric bikes and whatever it is uh, in your life that you can make that switch, um, it is really one of the, the single best things you can do uh, to 
help protect our environment and reduce air pollution uh, in the state. So that I'm going to add that to my call to action. Buy an EV. Thank you. And as buying a new car, that can also be challenging because there's no key fobs that will allow you to start your car. So there's that part. As we move into the Q&A session, I'm going to bring up a couple of questions. And there's some that are targeted directly at each one of you and some that we target to both. So I'll be pretty clear on if we're both going to answer them. The first question, thanks you for your public service and leadership. So we'll start there. Um, as we're looking at this, we would like to know, specifically in regard to agriculture, um, what policy priorities uh, are on the agenda to protect the most important farmland from sprawl and to get it into regenerative practices? Um, Senator Hansen, did you want to start or we will go to Peter Garnett? Yeah, I, I certainly can. I, I guess the, the part that overlaps the most right now with my legislative work is, is what I mentioned in Senate Bill 138. So there's two pieces that I think really help to, to move us down a more regenerative path uh, on the agriculture side. One is uh, having the State Department of Agriculture work with CSU and other research institutions to really thoroughly understand what are the carbon sequestration and capture options that we have in the ag sector and this is a real win-win for the environment and for ag producers because they can get paid to do those offsets, to do those uh, practices to, to, to capture more carbon. And so it actually becomes a new source of revenue if you're a farmer or a rancher. So that I think is a really exciting new thing that we're trying to get done inside that bill. And the second thing I would mention is agrivoltaics because you're absolutely right. The land use issues are gonna get more and more intense, whether it's sprawl, or you know, the next solar farm that we need to build, we've got things that are gonna to start to come into more conflict because um, you know, we're gonna run out of the easy places and we're gonna to have to, as we continue to build out say solar panels, we've got to figure out how to integrate it with ag production. And that's really what agrivoltaics is. So imagine you know, a potato farm in the San Luis Valley and you use the solar panels to provide partial shade uh, and channel you know, natural precipitation and you increase the yields of the, the, the farmland underneath the, uh, the panels. Uh, that's just one kind of simple example, but that's what we're studying uh, in the bill is to try to figure out how to really integrate our clean energy future uh, with regenerative agriculture. So those are a couple of things trying to get, get done this year. Thank you, Senator. Speaker Garnett. Yeah, so um, it's a great question. And I would say one of the most bipartisan issues we see down at the legislature is the uh, movement to try to get more resources to Colorado's water plan and making sure that we have the resources across the state uh, at all the different water basins to help fund the projects uh, to help conserve uh, Colorado's water. We, we have taken monumental steps forward um, in, the, in uh, the direction of uh, water conservation uh, and protecting the water compacts that have governed uh, water distribution for over the you know over the last hundred years, and so this year you're going to see anywhere between sixty and eighty million dollars going towards these types of projects. Uh, that's going to help ag. It's it's going to help uh, water users across the state, all different regions. It is the biggest single investment that you've seen the Colorado Legislature make uh, in this area. Um, so that's it's not direct uh, to ag, but it's it's very 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 important. Um, there are ag projects. Uh, through uh, the Colorado Water Conservation Board uh, that get access to these funds. And it's something that is really uh, key to Colorado's future. Thank you both. The next question specifically, Senator Hansen, I believe you can answer this one because it's your bill. <laughs> what is the current status on Senate Bill 22-138? I know it was introduced uh, February 16th, but can you give a status update on where that stands? Uh, yeah, happy to. So uh, have it through the first two committees in the Senate. It's going to be heard uh, fairly soon, I think, in, in Senate appropriations, and then we'll have that to the Senate floor, uh, I would guess, shortly after we finish the long bill and hope to get it over to Speaker Garnett for consideration uh, in, in early April. So we're making good progress. I think, you know, we've gone through the first two committees and, and I think resolved sort of 95% of the of the issues that have come up with different stakeholders. And so I think we're in a pretty good position to, to uh, move it more quickly now through the process. Thank you. And I will also post a link to that bill in the chat so that you all are able to follow the bill as it moves through session. So I'll post that in the chat. The next question specifically goes back to the dollars and allocations for projects. So the audience question is, are there checks and balances in place so the dollars allocated get their dedicated projects and resources? 
Uh, Speaker Garnett, I'll start with you. Thanks, Centrice. And I think it's from uh, Jane uh, Potts, who's House District 2. Um, great uh, constituent. Thanks so much, Jane, for that question. Um, yeah, so there's, listen, this is really, really important, not only for the people of Colorado to make sure that the dollars are going uh, to where we said they were going to go, but it's also really important for us to stay in compliance with the federal government when it comes to us um, uh, following the Treasury guidance on allowable uses uh, for the ARPA dollars. And so we've been talking with the governor's office about setting up a platform to track all of those dollars so people have a one-stop shop to uh, make sure those dollars are going to where they need to go. A lot of them are going out through dedicated sources that have a lot of checks and balances built into each one of them to make sure that uh, there isn't any fraud or abuse. It's it's very, very different than say like the PPP program that we saw the federal government try to stand up very quickly to try to get like needed relief immediately into small businesses across the country. There's a lot of fraud and abuse around that program. There is, this is much different. Um, uh, we put a ton of thought and care into each uh, pot of money. And um, I think that people should feel very confident that um, the dollars are gonna go where they need to go. Um, and there are multiple places uh, that will, there will be checks and balances. And I think due to a bill that we passed in 2020, there will also be an audit of um, CARES Act dollars that uh, will be done um, at the end of, in, on December 7th of this year. So in terms of all the federal dollars, um, even on the, in the earliest phases, there will be an audit that tracks um, uh, how those dollars were spent and used. Thank you, Speaker. Senator Hansen, anything to add? Yeah, not a lot to add. Just to say, you know, on the Joint Budget Committee, we have an amazing uh, professional staff uh, at the Budget Committee that help us go line by line through the budget, uh, line by line through every bill, uh, you know, that goes in front of the Appropriations Committees with, uh, you know, careful double checks of, you know, did it go to the right cash fund? Did it go to the right line item? And then we look at it a year later to make sure that it all matches up with what was passed in the law. So yeah, lots of checks and balances as part of the normal process. And then as the speaker mentioned, uh, when it comes to the federal funds, we've got an another layer of accountability on top of that and, and public disclosure. So I, I hope people feel like they can have a very high level of confidence in, in how we operate. Um, it's done in a very nonpartisan way on the you know, accounting side. The, you know, the state has a, a comptroller that looks very carefully at, at did we do what we said we would do. Uh, and I, I think Colorado's had a great track record on that for, for many years. Thank you. Along those same lines, um, how can organizations apply for some of these discretionary funds? Senator Hansen, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, you know, in, in the decisions we have made and in, in about two dozen that we're about to make, we've set up lots of different grant programs uh, for nonprofits, for communities to use that for Main Street redevelopment, for, you know, the water conservation districts, or this, all these different things that we've tried to to put in place to really get the money to the right place at the right time and do it with competitive grants is typically a, a you know a mode that we use and and uh, you know I know you're very familiar with that and and we're gonna we're gonna be doing that uh, at a very large scale um, and but but in category by category and so you know I think for folks uh, that are interested in, in seeing if they can can be part of one of those programs like if you work for a nonprofit we're gonna be setting aside some money to support nonprofits for example. Um, whatever it is, uh, let me go back to Alex's advice, which is go meet your senator and rep uh, and have them uh, help answer that question for you, uh, because that is exactly what one of, you know, that's exactly part of our job is to help na uh, citizens navigate, groups navigate uh, to, to find that right fit. Um, and so I really encourage you to do that. Thank you, Senator. I'm actually going to go to the next question and I'm going to direct this to Speaker Garnett. Um, just based on our time, we have about a little over 15 minutes left. So this is a small business question, Speaker Garnett. What are your priorities looking uh, when you're looking at development? New developments typically favor the space big box mega stores. Is there anything in the realm of creating space for small and local businesses in new developments? Yeah, thanks, Natrice, and thanks for that question. And um, I might actually have to jump uh, after this question, unfortunately. Um, some, you know, the day at the legislature, as you can tell, is always wild and crazy. And so I'm gonna have to jump a little early. So I apologize about that. This is a great question. Um, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, what we have been doing since receiving some of these dollars from the feds is partnering with local governments 
to encourage them uh, to, to get to sort of leverage those dollars together and or to set them aside and say these are available to any local governments if you change some of your zoning uh, requirements when it comes to some of these uh, preferred public policy outcomes that we're all working towards together. Because a lot of the decisions on uh, how to zone and how to you know, help big, small, medium-sized businesses isn't done necessarily on the state level, but it's done on the local level. And so we have tried to use the power of uh, the powers that we do have to work with these local governments to kind of drive to some of these better outcomes that have um, uh, that we all share, but that we don't have a ton of tools in the toolbox to help fix. Uh, that being said, um, we have uh, been doing a ton to help uh, small businesses across the state. I think when it comes to how we can recover um, out of this pandemic and make sure that we are bouncing back stronger and building back stronger, you know, focusing in on those small businesses is something that uh, we've really prioritized. We've uh, revamped uh, what we're doing at the Office of um, uh, Economic Development and International Trade. Uh, we have, in, you know, we've created new programs, we've created new access, um, and we are really trying to focus in on, on helping those small businesses. I think when it comes to, you know, uh, competing for those spaces, you know, we care deeply um, uh, about revitalizing our main streets and try to, again, partner with those local governments. But uh, uh, there, there are only so many things that we can do on the state level. Thank you, Speaker. And we do appreciate the time and understand that you will have to leave us. So we'll have the rest of the questions for Senator Hansen. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for having me on. It was great to see everybody. And always feel free to reach out um, if you ever feel the need and you're in good hands with Senator Hansen. Thank you. Senator Hansen, this next question is actually directed at you, so we're in a good space. It's coming uh, from Marion Murphy, who serves as a member of the Colorado Public Banking Coalition. And the question here is, from your experience learning of the option of the public bank ecosystem, what do you believe are the challenges and obstacles to passing legislation necessary to permit a public bank initiative to succeed in Colorado? Yeah, I, I appreciate that question. This is something that I've looked at uh, over the last several years to look at different options. I, the good news is we did uh, take a step forward on this last year. We passed a $40 million uh, green bank uh, that was a, creates a revolving loan fund that's run out of the Colorado Energy Office uh, that is really structured like a public bank where we're using that capital to really uh, accelerate investments in, in uh, clean energy technology and energy efficiency. Uh, and improving our environment in the state. Um, and so I, I, what I would say is that Colorado is, is, is trying this out. Um, you know, it's, it's really kind of a test case. Um, there's only a, you know, a couple of examples in the country of sort of a full state public bank. Uh, I think North Dakota is the one that, that I remember from, from my research. And uh, you know, they can serve different purposes and have different focus areas. Um, and what I guess what I would say in Colorado is that we're, we're looking hard at this uh, through the lens of a green investment bank. And so we took the first step on that last year. And I think we're going to start to see the data and results coming back from that effort over the next couple of years. Uh, and then we can reevaluate and see if we can ramp it up and scale it up uh, to, to double down on that progress. Thank you, Senator. We're going to shift um, directions on this one. This is talking about the pricing of housing. So the question um, goes into, are there any thoughts about skyrocketing housing prices in rural towns, particularly in regard to putting some limits on private equity and investment firms that are taking up the housing stock? Yeah, uh, <laughs> really great question. Um, you know, the, the legal options on limiting who can buy a house uh, are, are pretty tricky. I just, you know, I want to be very upfront about that. If, if you say, you know, sorry, this, you know, this firm or this company can't invest in, in real estate, that becomes a pretty difficult thing uh, in, in as far as a, a matter of legal treatment. Um, but I hear you loud and clear. I think there's a lot of worry that, that uh, you know, REITs, real estate investment trusts and private equity firms and venture capital firms um, are really driving huge cost escalation in the market and, and snapping up uh, starter homes and condos, uh, and, and, uh, and the knock-on effect is that it's driving up price. Um, I think there's, you know, the, the research that I've seen is that that is having some effect in some some particular places more and less. Um, it's not clear to me that that 
that it's had a giant effect on Metro Denver at this point, but you're right to mention, you know, especially some of the resort towns, it absolutely has had a big, big impact in some of the, the more isolated geographic areas uh, in, in the West Slope in particular. And so it's something we need, need to take a hard look at. And I think that's one of the things that the Affordable Housing Task Force did over the summer is how do we look at low and middle income opportunities uh, to create more housing and to provide more of a ladder for uh, young families and for more uh, accessible, affordable options. And, and so you're gonna see about a half billion dollars of state uh, support that is gonna be set up in a way that will leverage private capital uh, and private investment and individual uh, homeowners to try to create that first and second rung on the property ladder. Uh, but I appreciate you calling out sort of the, the larger issues around uh, you know, investment firms um, that might be just kind of distorting the market, I think is probably the best way to say it. Um, but I, I would just say, you know, from a legal standpoint, it's hard to limit uh, the, you know, who can buy and sell. Thank you, Senator. And I'll just add to this, I know enough to be dangerous, House Bill 22-1304 also looks at how we can, um, you know, help small communities and rural communities with affordable housing in their community. So I would encourage you all to follow that bill as well. It was introduced a couple of weeks ago and it does touch on some of the points that Senator Hansen mentioned a few moments ago. As we, um, next question, Senator, is regarding fossil fuel workers. So in the press, it was mentioned this morning that there would be a focus on just transition for fossil fuel workers. Can you expand on what resources will be set aside for this and how this will roll out? Yeah, well, I, I would say we are have already made significant progress on, on this topic. Um, there's certainly lots of work ahead of us, uh, but in 2019, I was very pleased to be part of an effort to uh, create you know, the funding mechanism and the Office of Just Transition. Um, in Senate Bill 236 in, in 2019, we created uh, a, a clear pathway for significant infusion of uh, resources to help the towns and the workers recover uh, particularly in the, in the wake of a uh, coal plant closure. And so Colorado is gonna be winding down the use of coal fire generation over the next several years. Uh, I would guess that we'll probably uh, finish that work by the end of the decade. Um, and in concert with that retirement schedule, we've also uh, have significant general funds and, and uh, other sources of support for the, you know, to things like backfilling the property tax for the local government so they can meet their obligations or helping workers to retrain or start a new apprenticeship or to transfer uh, to, a, to a new type of job. Um, we're, we've this year made some additional investments in economic development resources for local communities like Craig and Hayden as they anticipate the closure of those, those coal-fired units. So that's, you know, that's in motion. Um, there's been um, you know, we, we did a one-time allocation of $15 million last year. We did another $5 million this year. Um, the coal severance tax, about half of it flows into supporting the Office of Just Transition. Uh, we've got securitization options for closing fossil fuel assets and then using some of that savings uh, to then be brought back in to help the workers in the towns. Uh, and that could be hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, depending on the size of the closure. So a lot of, of great policy already in place. But then I think looking forward, um, we're going to need to carefully evaluate what the, you know, some of the other parts of the fossil fuel industry, you know, how that, how that plays out, and then carefully evaluate and, and react to, to those changing conditions. Um, but what I would say is that I think we can uh, claim uh, a lot of leadership in this area, that Colorado is ahead of the curve, um, and we've got very robust set of resources and tools in place, uh, particularly on the coal side. Thank you. And can, is there anything that you can say um, in regard to oil and gas as well, um, besides the coal discussion? Can we add that or apply that to oil and gas workers? Well, yeah, I think I think we've built a template that could could work really well for oil and gas. Um, I will say employment in oil and gas is going up right now. Uh, as we are above $100 oil, uh, there is, uh, you know, new new projects that are, are going to start moving forward in Colorado based on the on the permits that have, have been uh, put out, uh, particularly in the DJ Base Center north north of Denver in Weld County, um, and so uh, you know I would I would say in the near term there's you know not a big uh, issue, uh, but certainly long term as we continue to electrify and as oil demand 
falls over time, uh, which I'm certainly expecting it to do, uh, then we'll, we'll need to reevaluate. Thank you. The next question looks at our natural disasters, Senator. Are there any discussions about efforts to mitigate against natural disasters, especially in light of the recent Marshall Fire and the fire at NCAR in Boulder? Yeah, we've we've made some huge investments uh, and we'll continue to do that in this year's budget on wildfire mitigation and suppression, um, which is sort of trying to stop the problem before it happens and then and then of course address it if we do have a fire. Um, you know, new things like helicopters and fire retardant, uh, you know, uh, carrying airplanes, we've got more on the ground crews, but more importantly, we've invested, I think, a lot more in prevention. And so that means uh, making sure that that mitigation is happening at the local level, that folks are clearing away fuel from near houses that are in the, the wildland interface or the WUI. Um, but of course, we know that our, our understanding of what is the WUI has changed after the Marshall Fire. Uh, no one, I think, thought that there was that big a risk. And now it's really clear, especially after a few days ago with another fire in Boulder County, um, that, that there's elevated risk. Now, why are we there? Well, climate change is a big piece of that explanation. Um, no doubt about it. And we are much hotter and drier than we were you know, just a couple decades ago. Uh, that means more, more fuel that is dried out uh, and more risk uh, for wildfire. And you know, I, I think the, the scary part is uh, the state budget is not gonna be able to keep up with this. Uh, I just wanna be very very blunt with folks. The, the risk is, is outrunning our ability to, to stay ahead of it. Um, and so we, we really need to rapidly uh, you know, continue the climate leadership that we've shown, uh, help lead the world on, on making rapid changes to, you know, to our, our greenhouse gas emissions. Because, um, and I suppose the other thing to say is that a lot of these climate changes are in motion and are unstoppable at this point. And so we've got to think about mitigation and, and how we lower that risk because there's so much inertia in this system. I mean, even if we stopped all uh, greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow, the world will continue to warm for decades. Uh, you know, and I know there's lots of scientists and physicists on this call uh, who are very familiar with that, that part of our, of our issue, you know, climate change issue. Um, and so it's, it's mitigation and adaptation uh, for decades to come. Thank you, Senator. And in essence of time, I think what we'll do now is thank you for your time. Thank you for serving with us. And thank you for answering some of these questions. I know they cover a variance of topics and you're so well educated and know exactly what exactly it is you're doing with them. So I appreciate all of the discussion. Um, so thank you. Wait, for your time. Could you please let my kids know that? Yeah. I, I, I would love it if somebody could just send them a quick note. I'll send them a TikTok because I think that's how kids can Yeah, <laughs> perfect, perfect. Thank you, Senator, appreciate it. Well, all as, right. we're, Thanks, as we're closing out, thank you. Um, I wanna just you know reiterate that our efforts in regard to how we're spending the money, how we're looking at utilizing the funds and how we're leveraging some of the things that we've talked about today, affordable housing, workforce, et cetera, I just want you all to know that our legislators are extremely dedicated to making sure we solve these problems. And so I thank you for the time and take the honor of being able to narrate um, the conversation with both Senator uh, Hansen as well as uh, Speaker Garnett. So thank you. And Brenna, I will go ahead and turn it back over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Natrice. Really an honor again to uh, share the screen with you. Really appreciate your leadership and definitely, you know, rest assured knowing that you are um, in the role that you are working with both the executive and legislative branches of the government. Um, thank you all to the coalition members. Wonderful to have you here today. And of course, to Speaker Garnett, to Senator Hansen. I really wish that we could have had some of our Republican uh, colleagues and partners join us today, but we all know kind of what happened there. So we thank you for your flexibility. Um, um, also want to pass a, a word of gratitude to our sponsors, which I know Jane will um, highlight and honor here as we as we disconnect. Um, lastly, I'll just say to each and every one of you, thank you so much for tuning in today. And please do find a couple things that resonate with you and move them into action moving forward, because if we let these just stay as thoughts, progress will not be made. So please work with us, lean in and engage to move these wonderful, ambitious thoughts, visions and into actions and into progress. Thank you so much. And with that, I'll pass it over to Jane to conclude the event today. 
Thank you so much, Brenna, and thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, I don't know about you all, but for me, this has been a really exciting and informative panel. Um, I really take a lot of heart in knowing about the bipartisan collaboration that's happening behind the scenes. And as Senator Hansen said, so often does not get highlighted. So I'm really glad that we were able to highlight that here, even though our uh, Republican uh, senators and representatives weren't able to join us today. Um, I wanna say a huge thank you to our speakers who took the time out of their busy schedules in the midst of a legislative session to come and talk with us, to share their perspectives and priorities for the state. Um, it's been really an honor to hold this discussion and hear from legislators on how we can find common ground and build Colorado forward and make Colorado continue to be a leader in finding solutions to the tough challenges that we face. So really grateful to everyone and to Natrice, so eternally grateful for you and your leadership. So thank you so much for moderating the panel as well. Um, I'd like to close our time with a few calls to action, um, pretty similar to what Brenna just shared, but uh, at first, if, if you haven't joined the coalition already, please consider joining uh, the coalition and then joining our working groups. They are the engine and the heartbeat of the coalition. Um, and please think about, you know, the comments that you heard today from our legislators uh, and consider implementing, you know, whatever resonates with you the most, but um, really think about what you heard today and, and take that um, to heart when you, when you leave here. Um, you could also share your story with us and make your voice heard through our monthly newsletters, uh, where you can tell others about your work and the initiatives that you care about. We'd love to highlight you in an upcoming newsletter. And then finally, join us for our next all coalition gathering in June, where we're going to focus on Colorado's climate efforts and the current energy transition that we talked about at length today. Uh, I want to say a final thank you to our sponsors who have made this work possible. Foot Law Firm, Vermilion, and Odell Brewing. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for supporting a regenerative future for Colorado. With that, I want to say a huge thank, thank you to our wonderful speakers again and to each of you for joining us on this journey today. We're going to be dropping a link in the chat for you to share your thoughts on the event. And this feedback really helps us to make sure that we're creating the most valuable events for our members as possible. And then as a final note, today's event was recorded and will be sent to you in the coming days. Uh, with that, we hope that you have a great rest of your evening and we look forward to our next time together. Thank you so much, everyone.